From Montana's News Leader, this is the MTN 530 News. COVID numbers on the decline and more hope on the horizon. Coming up, details on where you can soon expect a new mass vaccination clinic. I'm Mike Dennison in Helena. Right to work bills are coming before the legislature. We'll tell you what's at stake. But first, bundle up, put the heat on high. Dangerously cold temperatures are here and we may not even get above zero for a while. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Russ Riesinger. Cold weather continuing to create concerns, not only in the Magic City, but all across Montana. We turn now to Chief Meteorologist Ed McIntosh with all the frigid details. Ed, a special kind of cold. That's for sure, especially when we factor in any kind of wind at all. Let's take a look because you can see pretty much everywhere except the most western portions of the state. We're looking at wind chill values potentially at minus 40, even up to minus 55 in those gray shaded areas across northeastern Montana, extending into northwest North Dakota. But the wind chill value sometimes is confusing for folks. So wind chill really has to deal with people and with animals and the body heat that we put out. Around our bodies, we'll see a bit of uh, heat that will start to develop just thanks to the natural workings of our body. And that acts as an insulator to help keep some of the cold away from us. You add in just a little bit of a wind and suddenly 20 degree temperatures that feel like 20 degrees, it whisks that area of warmth away from our body. And all of a sudden a 20 degree reading with a 20 mile per hour wind feels more like we're at about four degrees. The wind chill values are going to be a whole lot colder than that and isn't going to take much wind to drive it down. We'll talk about that coming up in a few minutes. All right, thank you. And whenever temperatures drop down below zero, the concern for frostbite goes up. Local emergency physicians are already seeing cases from the most recent cold snap. Frostbite happens when part of your body actually freezes and causes damage to the tissue, potentially leading to the loss of fingers, toes, ears, your nose, or any other limb. Frostbite almost always happens when you're doing something normal, but then an accident happens or things don't go quite as planned and you get stuck outside longer than expected. When you're going to notice at first your hands starting to feel tingly and then whitish in color, um, and those can be in, or stiff, and those can be some of the early signs of frostbite. I think one of the things people should watch out for is whenever the temperatures drop down below zero, particularly into the negatives, like with the wind chill, we're in the negative 20s potentially mm -hmm. tonight, you can be developing frostbite in as little as 15 to 30 minutes. Now, Dr. Ellen says if you think you might have frostbite, try to get inside, start warming up as soon as possible. Don't rub the affected part. That can do more damage to the tissue. Put it in warm water right around 99 to 100 degrees and let it gradually rewarm. Now, if your skin starts to form blisters or appears purplish, seek medical attention right away. And Dr. Ellen says even if you're just heading down the street or running to the store, make sure to bring along a coat, hat, gloves, and an extra layer of clothing. Now, Riverstone Health in connection with St. Vincent Healthcare is planning a mass community vaccination clinic for those in phase 1B. 975 doses of the Pfizer vaccine will be available. The community clinic will be held next week at Metro Park. Days and times are yet to be determined. Yellowstone County has to decide how those in Phase 1B can get registered. Phase 1B consists of those 70 and older and those ages 16 to 69 with high risk medical conditions. Well, could COVID cases in Yellowstone County be trending down? That does seem to be the case after an update from Yellowstone County health officials. But that being said, they say, a viral illness like COVID tends to move in waves. Hospitalizations are down to 30 from 150 during the height of the pandemic. Health officer John Felton says that's promising news. And on top of that, people tend to be eager about getting the vaccine because demand is extremely high, but supply remains low. He says the state is working hard to try and increase that supply. Hopefully we'll continue to see the, the improvements we've seen and that next month when we stand here, we can, we can talk about another good month. Um, it's up to all of us to do our part, and I'm, I'm happy to say that right now we're doing well, and hopefully we'll continue that. The volume of requested tests has also come down as the prevalence of the disease in the community comes down. Felton also says the county's test positivity rate has been under 10% for the last five weeks now. Well, the light at the end of the tunnel continues to shine a little brighter, but Montana and America are far from being out of the woods. 
The state saw 217 new cases today and two more COVID-19 related deaths. Total case count in Montana now sits at more than 96,000 since the pandemic began, with nearly 92,000 people recovered. The state's death toll from the virus stands at 1,329. Next week, the legislature is scheduled to hear a bill that would turn Montana into a right to work state, a move bitterly opposed by labor unions. But as MTN's Mike Dennison reports, it's one of several bills before the legislature that would make it harder for unions to collect dues or fees from members and non-members alike. First, let's talk about the term right to work and what it means. Essentially, most right-to-work laws say any union that bargains a contract for a group of workers cannot charge any dues or fees to workers within that group who don't want to join the union. Representative Caleb Hinkle of Belgrade, a Republican, is sponsoring the main right-to-work bill, which is scheduled for its first hearing next week. I don't view it as anti-union at all. Um, no union that provides legitimate benefits should have to fear workers having a choice on whether to take those benefits unless that member wants to join that union and pay those fees. All this does is give them that choice. At least two other related measures making it harder for labor unions to collect dues from workers also are before the session. One of them, Senate Bill 89, would prohibit any government employer from allowing a payroll checkoff to collect dues from union members. The sponsor, Republican Senator Keith Regeer of Kalispell, says the government shouldn't be involved in collecting dues for groups actively involved in partisan politics. But union reps say dues money does not support a union's political activity and that government employers allow all kinds of payroll checkoffs. It's amazing to me that uh, it's still okay for the state government and public em uh, you know, employers to collect contributions to the National Rifle Association, but they're going to say it's not appropriate for a worker to be able to sign an agreement and have their dues deducted and sent to their union. Union officials also say the right to work bill is clearly meant to undermine organized labor by allowing workers to benefit from union contracts but not support the union financially. That's not a good thing for the state, they say. Success of unions and the size of unions historically in every economic measure goes hand in hand with the success and the size of the middle class. Hinkle says companies want to relocate or expand in right to work states, meaning better economic outcomes for Montana in the future. In the past, bills like these have failed in Montana, but with big Republican majorities and a GOP governor, supporters hope the politics are different this time around. Curtis, the president of Montana's largest union, says she'd like to know what Governor Gianforte thinks of these efforts. Whenever we've asked the governor about right to work, he said only that it's not one of his priorities for now. Reporting from Helena, Mike Dennison, MTN News. Thanks, Mike. None of these bills has had a debate or vote yet on the floor of the House or the Senate. Supporters and opponents of right to work laws often present dueling studies showing the alleged impact of wages and business activity in states with or without such laws. MTN News had an early look at a unique study that was just released this week. It comes from a research group that tends to support organized labor and refers specifically to Montana. Now, the study by the Illinois Economic Policy Institute didn't look just at wages or economic growth. It examined 20 different factors over a period of eight years that measured the overall quality of life and civic engagement in both right-to-work and non-right-to-work states. It found that right-to-work states as a group scored lower in every category on everything from life expectancy to poverty rates to consumer debt. It also said Montana fared better than right-to-work states in 15 of the 20 categories. Representative Caleb Hinkle of Belgrade who's sponsoring a bill to enact right-to-work laws in Montana, says he's seen multiple studies that show they lead to higher wages and more jobs. But a co-author of the Illinois study told MTN News it also shows that frontline workers during the pandemic fare particularly better in states with strong union representation. Unless the lawmakers in Montana think that teachers, police officers, firefighters, and nurses are overpaid, we should be seeking out ways to support these frontline workers, while the evidence, of course, suggests that right to work laws have the opposite effect. Hinkle's House Bill 251 is scheduled for its first hearing on February 16th before the House Business and Labor Committee. Just moments ago, it was announced that Montana State has found Jeff Choate's successor for head coach of the football team. 
Brent Vegan will become the 33rd head coach in program history. Vegan has been the associate head coach at the University of Wyoming since 2017, is now set to take over at Montana State. Choate departed Montana State in January to become the co-defensive coordinator at the University of Texas. He coached the Bobcats for four seasons, culminating with an 11-4 record and appearance in the semifinal round of the FCS playoffs in 2019. And we'll have more on this story coming up tonight on the MTN News at 10 here on Q2. Up next on tonight's MTN 530 News, tomorrow the gavel drops as the second impeachment trial of former President Trump begins. A quick glimpse inside what to expect. And in sports, the Skyview Falcons looking to end a losing streak against West. A team, uh, well, doing their very best to get it done. From Montana's news leader, you're watching the MTN 530 News. The impeachment trial of former President Trump begins tomorrow. So what should we expect and how will this be different from the first trial? Our Joe St. George is in Washington and explains. He's out of office, but back in the spotlight. Tuesday, the second impeachment trial of former President Trump begins. The biggest difference between his last trial and this one is perhaps the most obvious one. Former President Trump is no longer in office and his lawyers will repeatedly argue that fact throughout this trial to make the case this shouldn't be happening at all. But there are other differences as well. Big change number one, Chief Justice John Roberts will not preside. Instead, Senator Patrick Leahy, the president pro tem of the Senate, will. He gets that responsibility because he is the longest serving Democratic senator. Big change number two, what's at stake? The first time President Trump was facing removal from office. This time he's facing a potential ban from ever running for office again. He could also lose post-presidential perks like his yearly salary or staff which is paid by taxpayers. Big change number three, senators are not just jurors this time. But this is a very different case. Democratic Representative Jason Crow was a House impeachment manager, essentially the prosecutor, during the 2020 Senate trial and has spoken with the congressman who will attempt to convict Mr. Trump this time. You're actually trying uh, a case involving crimes and you're trying it in front of jurors, in this case, the senators, who are victims of the crime. And the prosecutors, the House managers, were also victims of the crime. One other change is the trial may not last as long. 17 Republican senators will need to join 50 Democrats in order to convict. And preliminary votes indicate Democrats may not have the votes. The White House is also pressuring the Senate to not delay President Biden's agenda. Former President Trump's first impeachment trial lasted 21 days, and the former president has indicated he has no plans on testifying in Washington. I'm Joe St. George. And CBS News will provide updates throughout the day here on Q2. You can also watch uninterrupted coverage from Court TV all day tomorrow on the KTVQ streaming app beginning at 11 a.m. To learn more about the streaming app, visit ktvq.com streaming. All right, up next in weather, how cold can we go this week? Chief Meteorologist Ed McIntosh says, brace yourself because the big chill is still yet to come. Storm Tracker weather starts now with meteorologist Ed McIntosh. I think all week long, this is the page that's going to get the most attention. Just how cold was it during the day today? We started off 13 below zero. We didn't make it above zero all day. Three below was the afternoon high. Notice sunset getting a little bit later now at 531 in the evening. We picked up some additional precipitation with that light powdery snow. Nobody's gone out to officially measure it at the airport yet, but I was getting reports about a half inch to an inch uh, total from that weather system. As we take a look with the Stockman Bank weather cam, we dropped now to five below. Still have some of that light powdery snow around the area and just a little bit of a breeze. We talked about those wind chill values makes that five below have the effect of 22 below when we start talking about frostbite and hypothermia. The roadways are a mess. Yellowstone River Bridge around the Billings area. You can see some of the haze around there. Reed Point, also some travel concerns there. Get around Aberdeen Hill. This is I-90 down towards Sheridan. Some very slick conditions at Bozeman Pass. It's been looking like this pretty much all day long, and there's not going to be much change from that either. And this cold is really the bigger story. You can see it's starting to dig in. It's really been in this area around Montana, Wyoming, 
down to around South Dakota and Nebraska. But even today, it started to dig in. You can see some of the cold air moving in uh, and around Kansas City, and then pulling back up towards the Great Lakes states. Minus three in the uh, Twin Cities here as we get into the evening hours. So the real cold layer of air is still across much of this region. We have some bands of snow showers that are developing here as we look into much of the Midwest and off towards the eastern seaboard, right on the edge where the cold and the warmer air are coming together. For us, we mentioned the wind chill values. 40 below could be fairly common, at least 30 to 40 below first thing in the morning and all these blue shaded areas, which is blanketing eastern Montana, much of northern Wyoming into the Dakotas and along the high line extending into northwest Montana or rather northwest North Dakota. We could be looking at wind chills of minus 50 or even colder first thing in the day. Here's the wind chill values right now. 32 below is what it feels like in Williston, 22 below in Miles City and in Billings, 26 below right now for a wind chill value for you in Livingston. And you can see Sheridan also in there. Cody, it feels like 29 below when you walk out. Now the thermometer is reading at eight below. So we have these single digits below zero in many locations across the eastern plains. Western Montana, it, it hasn't been as cold, but we still have the areas of some of this uh, snow falling. So visibility concerns on top of the bitter cold wind chills that we've seen across the region and the story stays pretty consistent. We have some of these light snow showers this evening that'll taper off, leaving us with the frigid cold temperatures with a clearing sky. It'll be especially cold factoring in those wind chills early tomorrow in eastern Montana. The jet stream staying to our south. By the time we go from Tuesday into Wednesday, it's really about the cold, but Wednesday into Thursday, we pick up the potential for some additional snow showers across the region. And we're just talking about maybe a half inch to an inch of snow here and there off and on over the course of the next several days. Lighter accumulations into the eastern plains where you're going to be dealing more with cold than anything else. So the temperatures overnight not factoring in a wind chill anywhere from single digits below to the 20s below zero. And then tomorrow afternoon, it's going to be a lot like today. We'll look for some single digits perhaps for the daytime highs, but most of the day will be in sub zero cold in and across the region. So here's our day planner. Temperatures drop down into the teens below zero and then really struggle to try and get any warmer than that by the end of the day tomorrow. In the extended outlook, look for those temperatures to stay very cold. And in fact, look at the temperatures by the time we start looking Thursday into Friday. Those overnight temperatures are getting close to record cold readings. Back to you, Russ. All right, thank you, Ed. Coming up in sports, the old saying goes, in order to be the best, you have to beat the best. And uh, Lady Falcons of Skyview looking to do just that this Friday. We'll meet one of the keys to pulling off that big upset next. Well, Friday night brings a rematch of one of the games of the season between West and Skyview's girls. If the Falcons are going to snap a long losing streak in the series, they'll need a big performance from someone who's had a lot of them in her career. Q2's Casey Conlon has more. Struggling for the words to describe Skyview's Brooke Berry? Let her coach help. I have uh, described her as a Corvette on steroids, and um, I'm telling you what, she is uh, sleek, um, she's long, she's fast, um, and uh, she's polished. Brent Montague let Berry drive the car last year when she averaged 16 points a game, second best in the state. But now, it's her ride. Through the first half of the season, Barry leads the AA in scoring and assists and has Skyview off to a 5-2 and two start. Thanks to a new team mindset after the program snapped a 19-year state drought last March. We walk into every game with confidence knowing that we should win or at least it should be close. I mean, there's no reason for us to be blown out or anything like it was in the previous years of the program. I think the biggest thing is belief. You know, I think there's been a lot of, um, there was a lot of hope last year. I think these kids have now, they've played a lot of basketball together um, and they've played a lot of good basketball. They've had valuable experience. Barry included. The junior has been one of the best scorers in the state since she entered high school, but Montague has challenged her to become a better overall player and it's working. Definitely defense. I mean, he makes me work hard in practice every single day and I just know what he expects from me out of practice and it shows in the game. Like I've definitely matured as a player. I have seen a, a big change in her in the last year just from that standpoint and, and it's she's she's still where she's at right now. She still has a lot of room for improvement and that's scary. As does the entire team evidenced in a loss three weeks ago to undefeated West 
when Skyview let a lead get stolen away in the final seconds. Let's just say that it, I, I, I may or may not have spent a night on the rims that night. I think about it often. That's a gut one. I mean, that was a tough one, but I think next time we play them, we're just going to want it so much more because we know what we can do. We didn't really get brought down by it. We just took it as a lesson, not really a loss, just a lesson, and we got better from it. Since that game, the Falcons have won five straight by an average of 25 points per. Think they know the rematch is Friday? Good job. They get deflection, turns into a trap. Casey Conlon, MTN Sports. All right, tip-off set for 7 o'clock Friday night. West has won 17 straight over Skyview, spanning nine years. We'll be right back. We talked earlier in the newscast about the threat of frostbite and hypothermia, and there's a few th uh, safety tips that you can take along the way. Dress in layers, make sure that you got everything covered, especially on these cold mornings. Make sure you don't leave the kids out of the bus stop because even a slight delay will leave them out there even longer. And try to limit travel as things could get very slick and we've got some visibility problems as we continue to see some light snow. So plan ahead, make sure you have a travel kit if you do have to go. Prepare ahead and make sure you let somebody know exactly what your travel plans are going to be. Temperatures overnight will drop down into the teens below zero pretty consistently. The afternoon highs will likely stay uh, colder than zero all the way until we start getting into the weekend. By the time we get into Sunday and Monday, don't be deceived by those slightly warmer temperatures because if we pick up a little bit of a breeze, we'll still be dealing with those very cold wind chills and with light powdery snow over the course of the week, we could be dealing with some problems of blowing snow as well over us so we're far from done with this all right thank you ed thank you for joining us we're back at nine on the cw and right here at 10 on q2 have a good evening